Hello. Welcome to our fireside chat with Professor Ross Anderson of Cambridge University. Before we get started, I would like us to run a quick pause just to get ourselves um, into the discussion and allow you guys to direct how we proceed. So there's a quick poll there. Have you heard of Professor Sanderson before today? Yes, no, please. Okay, I would like to get the results of that from the team, see what you guys think, and then um, that will shape our discussion. Okay, that's really interesting. So Ross, with that, I would like to hand over to you to tell us a little bit about yourself, so that some of our audience who are not aware of your background, at least get to know you in person. Thank you, sir. Well, I started off in the 70s with a degree in maths um, at Cambridge, um, and I then uh, got into the hardware engineering side of things. My first job was working on inertial navigation sets, um, taking uh, devices that were um, designed to find out where a fast jet is and rebuilding them so that they could find out instead where a midget submarine was beneath the North Sea. And then I, I did a number of things. I um, got interested in cryptography. I um, worked for a number of banks. Uh, back in the mid 80s, I was looking after security of cash machines at, at Barclays. And then I went out to Hong Kong and did similar stuff for um, Standard Chartered. And, and then I worked on prepayment electricity meters. In the early 90s, I uh, decided that I was suffering from imposter syndrome. I was being an information security expert without knowing anything about it. So I went back to Cambridge and did a PhD in security protocols with Roger Needham, and I liked it, so I stayed. And, and since then, uh, I found that I actually had an advantage over many other security researchers in that I'd done it for real in the real world. And so my mission has been to make security engineering into a discipline, into something that you can use in anger in real life, rather than just about you know theorems on a blackboard. That's very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's actually going to lead me to one of the things you're popularly and, and probably the world known and acclaimed in that area, which is you are world renowned academic and notably for two primary areas. One is economics of security and the other one of uh, security engineering. Just tell us a little bit about security engineering. And I know you have third edition book you've published with uh, uh, a known and, um, Anderson consultant. Uh, just tell us a little bit about your interest and what led you into security engineering. Well, it started off being a practical problem of how do you um, deal with a cash machine fleet? How do you uh, protect it against people who are trying to steal money? Uh, then how do you go about selling um, electricity um, in countries where many people don't even have addresses, let alone credit ratings? And um, that led to a design of prepayment meters, which is now standardized and of which there's 400 million in 100 countries worldwide. And um, there's a large gap between the theory of security as you can pick it up in conferences and, and what security looks and feels like in practice. Um, when I was starting to work in this field in the 1980s, there was a little bit of mathematical theory around cryptography, not as much as there is now, but there was some. And there was a little bit of theory around um, access controls, uh, the, the mechanisms used by um, computer CPUs and operating systems to limit access to particular processes. But there was nothing else. The rest of it was, you know, um, fault wisdom, snake oil, and so on. And one of the things that we discovered um, early on is that the way in which cryptography goes wrong, for example, with cash machines in banking, is very different from the threat models that people talk about in academic papers. In academic papers uh, from the 1970s, the debate was about whether um, the data encryption standard had long enough keys or whether 56-bit keys were so short that somebody would eventually be able to do key search. And uh, sure, as everybody predicted by the late 1990s, people could do key search, 
and the EFF built a machine that Julie did it. Yet to this day, there are millions of electricity meters which rely on DES and similar algorithms to protect um, the power company's revenue, because in such an application, key search um, isn't actually a problem. If somebody's going to defeat an individual meter, they can always just connect physical copper wires around it. Um, the uh, things that you're worried about are, more, are, are different and more subtle. They tend to be about control of the mechanism that's used to dispense credit and how you balance uh, sales of credit against me measurements of electricity. And so there's a number of pieces come together. Now, generalizing this, we find that when we're trying to protect something like an operating system or a mobile phone, um, then um, there's a lot of contextual stuff comes into play. And it's really important that people should um, understand some real case studies as well as just some blackboard theory. I would agree, I would agree. As a practitioner that work in the industry, I see where theoretical trait model can be conducted. And if you were still to go on and execute that uh, deployment uh, in real life and deploy it, when you carry out a penetration test, you still find some holes. And you wonder if you did the trait model incorrect and execution happened very well, why do I still have this residual risk or these holes that are not uh, addressed by the so quote unquote, the, the, the theoretical trait modeling? But where do you see the convergence between economics of security, which is one area of yours uh, to have, and then security engineering? Uh, do, do, do they interleave? Do they, do they coexist or are they separate pillars? Well, not at all, because one of the things that we realized by about the year 2000 um, is that you can't make stuff more secure by adding more features. Now, during the 1990s, we were worried about the insecurity of the internet, and so we added lots more features. You know, we added encryption, we added protocols, we added firewalls, we added this, we added that, but things didn't get any better. And then we began to realize that incentives are absolutely key to this. Um, if one person um, protects a system and the other pays the cost of failure, you can expect trouble. So if Alice is the sentry and uh, Bob is the person who gets it in the neck, if Alice is asleep on the job, then there's going to be um, eventually some serious eruptions. For example, um, take card payments. If you don't want there to be a whole lot of um, frauds against card payments, then it's down to the merchants to take care and the banks who buy transactions from the merchants, the so-called acquiring banks. Yet the costs of fraud fall on the cardholder and on the banks that issue um, cards to the cardholder and because the acquiring banks and the issuing banks are usually not the same banks there isn't enough incentive for everybody in the system to take an appropriate level of care so you try and fix that by having organizations like visa and mastercard and by having national rules over liability and the payment services directive and so on but it's all very much a second best best clutch after the fact and so it's really important to understand where incentives are misaligned Let's take another example, SIM swap fraud. Um, phone companies only take enough care when issuing SIM cards to guard themselves against the loss of you know, a few hundred minutes of phone time. But when banks start using possession of a phone number to prove access to an account, and when cryptocurrency exchanges start using your possession of a mobile phone to prove access to an account that may have a million dollars of bitcoins in it, then of course the SIM swappers will somehow get at the phone company They'll bribe a phone company employee or they'll social engineer them over the phone uh, and, and they'll get a SIM card that works on your account. So this is another example of how things fail at the level of incentive. Now, if you're doing security engineering, you've got this tripod. You've on the one hand got the technology and on another hand, you've got the economics. And on the third hand, the third leg, as it were, you've got the psychology, the usability of the system. And if you don't get all three of these right, then you can expect trouble. Thank you. Interesting. Interesting. Do you have a model that can actually tell you when there is imbalance in this triad type relationship? I, I'm just curious just to know, or is that something that is experiential from experience, you know, that needs to know how you balance these three requirements in order to have a stable, secure, robust system? I think that modeling is the wrong way to go at this level of meta. Um, people who um, have spent all their lives at university love models because you can write maths on the blackboard and um, it makes you feel nice. Uh, but 
in, in the real world, you have to understand a lot of depth and subtlety of context. And so the right way to learn something like this is by means of case studies, right? That's what's typically done um, in post-experience education and MBAs, for example. And similarly, um, there will probably eventually be a call for post-experience cybersecurity education. Um, at present, people who want to do cyber security may just start with a, a, a vanilla bachelor's degree or they might do a specialist master's. But only 10% of what you learn in that master's will actually be of direct relevance to you. The rest is stuff that's of interest to the professors. And so in the, in the long term, I think what's going to happen is that people will come back to university, perhaps not for a full master's, but for executive education, and we'll get top-up courses where they'll go through lots of case studies of um, security failure, and they'll learn security engineering skills or hone their security engineering skills that way, just as MBA students hone their business skills by looking at companies that succeeded and companies that failed. Thanks, Ross. You mentioned about uh, blockchain in your example prior. And I know that um, you have not been a, a fan of crypto as such. What's your perspective on cryptocurrencies, in particular in regards with energy consumption, case study, uh, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin mining? Well, um, cryptocurrency was supposed to provide an alternative means of exchange and store of value. And within the context where it emerged, um, it, it made perfect sense, I suppose, because among the um, the cypherpunks in um, San Francisco, um, you know, many of the, the guys there were associated with the movement to liberalize marijuana. And although the Californians voted to legalize weed in their state, um, the American government still makes it very difficult for a, a, a weed grower or a weed shop to have a bank account. So having an alternative means of doing that made perfect sense as a civil liberties move. Um, however, the way things have developed, um, cryptocurrencies firstly became an instrument for um, underground markets. Then they became an instrument for capital flight from Russia and China. And they more, more recently become an instrument for securities fraud. And at the same time, the fact that um, uh, mining has, is, is, is self-regulating and that the more miners there are, the harder the, the problem gets. Uh, it means that um, in order to do a Bitcoin transaction, you're burning something like half a ton of CO2. And this is just completely insane. Um, you know, there was um, an, an article in the press recently about how the uh, police raided a farm in Devon thinking they must be growing weed because of the amount of energy they were burning. And it turned out they were mining Bitcoin instead. And what's really needed is a change in the laws so that in future the police raid the Bitcoin miners and leave the weed farms alone. <laughs> so um, that summed it up for me. I know I could, I could tell your perspective on it, but there are some other good things they are doing in um, distributed ledger technology, in the FinTech, in DeFi, decentralized finance, where you, you don't have that monopoly, uh, monopoly uh, and you don't have that central bank being a bottleneck. Does that not resonate well in terms of the new fintech spin-offs from blockchain? No, it doesn't. Um, firstly, I don't accept that Bitcoin is decentralized at all. Um, all the silicon is made in TSMC. All the mining rigs are made by Bitmain. Um, there are about three um, interlinked uh, cartels based in China that um, manage uh, the great majority of the mining. The um, the cryptocurrency exchange business tends to be a monopoly in every country that you look at. But, you know, Binance has got most of the Chinese business, although since China made Bitcoin trading illegal, they had to move to Hong Kong and then Malta and other places. Um, in the English speaking world, most people who buy uh, Bitcoin go to Coinbase. Uh, and this, this is um, anything but decentralized. I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. The network effects that cause technology businesses to concentrate work even more strongly in this space. As for uh, DeFi, for distributed finance, um, this is simply a way um, of escaping the requirement, the legal requirement, um, that if you move large amounts of money around, you should know who the recipient is. Now, the, um, the rules in America say that if I go into a, 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 
uh, Coinvest, for example, and I bit, buy a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and I want to send these to some ransomware operator in Russia, then if that operator is not using um, a wallet which is hosted at a recognized exchange, um, then Coinbase will have to go and get a copy of his passport and gas bills and so on like he was opening a normal bank account. And how people get around this is that they go to cryptocurrency exchanges in countries like Switzerland and the Czech Republic, which pretend to keep proper records but don't really. And then they can turn the Bitcoin into Litecoin and then turn it into um, some, maybe back into Bitcoin or something and then they can send it to the, uh, to the ransomware guy or, uh, or whatever. And what's happening with, with DeFi is that you're getting exchanges being set up that will turn your Bitcoin into Litecoin, for example, without any human intervention, right? So there's nowhere where the police can knock and show a warrant. So, you know, this looks to me like um, evasion rather than anything constructive. Interesting. Uh, in terms of addressing some of these concerns you raised, and you're not just alone there, I think there's a other uh, school of thought that have raised similar things. What do you then propose? Are we going to go down the regulation? Because I hear recently in the US and very many other people, apart from the ESG aspect, which is the environmental, social and economic uh, governance aspect, there is the call for regulating uh, blockchain and uh, any uh, thing to do with uh, DLT. What, what's your opinion on that? Well, we've already got an awful lot of laws about banking um, as a result of hard experience over hundreds of years in both Britain and America, and in fact elsewhere too. And the, um, the, block, the current blockchain operators simply ignore all these laws because it's convenient for them to do so. Now, you may recall that when Uber started, they just ignored all the taxi laws everywhere. And then eventually people noticed that um, Uber drivers were driving 10 or 12 or 14 hours a day, and that Uber drivers didn't get police criminal record backgrounds checks. And if they raped a passenger, then um, Uber wouldn't report it to the authorities or help with getting um, information. And eventually Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London says, listen, you guys, you say that you're a platform, not a taxi company but you're wrong, you're a taxi company and I'm pulling your license, right? And then Uber panicked and they sued and they got rid of their old CEO and got a new CEO. And eventually Uber was brought within the regulatory ambit. Now, if I get an Uber in Cambridge, the guy is prominently displaying a, a Cambridgeshire County Council license, right? Because without that, he's not allowed to do business. Similarly, um, our governments have given the cryptocurrency scoundrels a free ride for far too long. Um, we've got laws in the European Union, which are also laws in the UK, we haven't changed them yet, and I hope we won't change them, around the payment services regulations. And if somebody acts as a money service business, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they've got to do even if they aren't a bank. So if Marks & Spencer offers you a, a, a debit card that is uh, based on their store rather than a bank account, they've got to keep enough cash at hand that they can pay everybody off if they all turn up and want their money back. Now. The Financial Conduct Authority has decided not to ask the payment service regulator to enforce this um, against cryptocurrency. Why? Because they were afraid that they would get shouted at by um, conservative MPs who are aligned with um, you know, cryptocurrency interests. So it's all political. It's the same kind of game that Uber was playing. And eventually, the cryptocurrency business is going to be brought to heel and forced to obey banking and securities law like everybody else. And these laws exist to stop people being ripped off at scale. Thank you. Um, one of the follow-up question there is that, um, do you propose a more traceable consensus algorithm for truly distributed ledger? Because you mentioned about it's, it's not quite distributed. Uh, it could well be centralized or course distributed amongst more you know, known hands or, or geographies, is there a proposal then for a more traceable consensus algorithm? Well, what's actually happening is that the, the world's central banks are, are seriously thinking about having central bank um, digital currency. Now, that quite possibly doesn't mean very much more um, than um, being able to open an account at the Bank of England. In the old days, like 100 years ago, um, you could open an account at the Bank of England, but eventually the bank stopped accepting new customers. 
and eventually it was only a, a few old aristocratic families still had accounts at the Bank of England. But there's, there's nothing that would stop them doing that again. At the moment, it's basically only banks who have accounts at the Bank of England. But um, the, the, the Sveriges Riksbank, for example, the Swedish central bank, um, is now um, exploring the possibility of opening its interbank system um, to um, payments that would be settled through um, SWISH, which is a payment system that all Swedes use. And if that happens, then you end up um, with ordinary citizens being able to bank with the government's bank uh, and being able to use a card or whatever you get given in normal commerce. Um, and um, that raises all sorts of issues. Um, you know, do you want the government competing with the commercial banks? And if so, should they charge a negative interest rate and so on and so forth? But these are, uh, you know, respectable payment systems. They're not Wild West payment systems like, um, um, like Bitcoin. Thank you. Um, recently, I know the UK, in fact, also the US, they have put forward a proposal to have their own crypto uh, or digital currency. Okay, and if we're largely um, one of the things we're hearing about the, the current uh, cryptocurrencies because of it's, uh, it's bad for the environment, um, it's not sustainable, um, I quote, the amount of um, CO2 that's been produced is more than a particular country, say Finland, then it begs the question, why are the countries, these countries, especially the UK and the US, want to have their own cryptocurrency? Well, if you go back about five years when uh, bankers started to pay attention to this, there was great fear among the banking community that they might uh, lose their monopoly, that they might be sidelined. And there was a panic stricken rush in um, the world's central banks to go and um, acquire expertise um, at Bitcoin. And a number of consultants unscrupulously sold them all sorts of weird uh, proposals and pilots and prototypes. Um, I think it's most people would now realize that if a central bank makes um, bank accounts available to ordinary people, then that's not really a big game changer. There are a number of things about the existing uh, banking system um, that are um, substandard and that could do with getting fixed. Um, how they're getting fixed at the moment is by means of fintechs, which use open banking to access people's bank accounts to do overlay stuff on them. For example, giving you a cheaper means of sending money to relatives overseas or giving you a way of shopping around to see where you can get the cheapest mortgage. Um, that's where the, the cutting edge of innovation is there, um, at least in developed countries. In developing countries, of course, you've got uh, mobile phone payments, which have... Um, uh, been revolutionary in a number of countries in Africa and South Asia. Thanks. Moving course a bit and changing direction. So you, we're currently faced with uh, transparency and trustworthy in AI. Uh, whether it is uh, AI being used for what we call high risk area in deciding who gets a loan, who doesn't get a loan, or high risk area in terms of autonomous driving, um, in areas where it's used for facial recognition for crime and various other things. So um, the call there has been about fairness and, and reducing bias in AI. What, what's your take and what, what do you recommend in, in, in your personal uh, in, uh, perspective on that and how to make those address these current societal concerns? Well, what we've um, seen is that AI came across us in a number of waves. Now, until about 2012, there was the slow adoption of machine learning techniques uh, for things like um, spam filtering, uh, for things like antivirus detection um, and um, abuse detection of various kinds, for example, in firewalls. Um, round about 2012, you had two groups, one in Canada and one in Switzerland, found that deep neural networks could do really, really well at recognizing images. And that, of course, kicks off a revolution um, with a number of consequences. Um, some of the consequences are direct. You can now uh, build CCTV cameras that can recognize people um, individually out of databases of hundreds of thousands of persons. And that was never possible before. So the, the kind of things that we saw in the movie Minority Report could now come to pass. 
However, for the most part, what's happening is that lots of people have been carried away with enthusiasm for what the technology can do, and they haven't stopped to think about the, the basic security engineering aspects. For example, people who use neural networks in machine vision in cars in autonomous driving tend to be freaked out by the possibility that someone might put up an adversarial image, some kind of nasty pattern that they project onto a bridge which causes the car to swerve and crash. Um, but this, I think, isn't such a big deal because it's always been possible to cause cars to swerve and crash. Right, you go to the roadworks, you kick the cones into the hole in the road, and the next car that comes along crashes into the hole. Right, that's been the case for decades. Does anybody lie awake at night worrying about it? No, if it ever happens, you arrest the little so-and-so who did it and throw him in jail. End of story. So rather than making machine vision systems less capable out of a worry about adversarial images, a better approach is to uh, teach these systems to learn when they are under attack. In other words, to have an alarm system which says, you know, cripes, I'm seeing something now that's really confusing. I've not seen this before. I better beep and wake up the driver. You know, that's a better approach to that kind of um, threat. Um, another example is that people who build machine learning systems haven't stopped to think about what happens if somebody does a service denial attack on them. For example, by choosing confusing sentences to go into a natural language processing system. So you just you just tell your NLP system a, a conundrum or a joke. You know, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. And um, Google Translate sits there and scratches its head because it can't figure out what's going on. So we, we played around with this stuff a bit and we found that you can really bamboozle um, uh, machine translation systems and toxic content filtering systems. Um, we're going to be publishing work in the next week or two about this. It's still in the responsible disclosure phase, but the basic idea is that if you use bad characters, if you use, for example, Cyrillic characters in an English text, a Cyrillic A looks exactly like an English A to a human eye, but to the machine, it looks something rather alien, right? And in this way, you can poison text that's input to um, a natural language processing system. Um, what you can also do is use the Unicode characters, which will cause text to run uh, back to front instead of front to back, which you use if you're putting Arabic into an English newspaper or English into a Hebrew newspaper. So I can send you a, an email in German, which says, pay a thousand euros into account number one, two, three, and if you stick it in Google Translate, it will come out in English as pay a thousand euros into account number three, two, one. There's all sorts of stuff you can do with this. And the reason is that the machine learning developers don't care about security. They don't think about security. It's somebody else's problem. They've not read my book. They don't realize that you should check input. You should sanity check output. You should check run times. You should do all sorts of sampling checks and cross checks, right? And you should always be suspicious you know, of uh, the kind of things that are in a reasonable threat model. But they don't do that. They say, you know, we're just doing the machine learning and everything else is somebody else's problem. So there's fundamentally an engineering failure here. Thank you very much for that. There's a question here. It says, um, that's from Caroline Sweeney. I said, Professor um, Anderson, really interesting talk so far. Do you think we are too focused on detection slash incident response with cyber attacks rather than focusing on preventing them in the first place? There's a follow on there to say, we know that detection doesn't stop all the breaches, cyber breaches, but most of the effort and resources put there rather than building security into systems from the design phase. What, what, what do you think? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do to try and push back on crime. I mean, crime prevention um, comes in its primary, tertiary and secondary, uh, tertiary, secondary and tertiary forms, and you try and stop people offending. Um, you know, whether by um, educating kids who seem to be about to go astray or deterring people who are thinking of, of doing bad stuff. And um, the National Crime Agency does do stuff with kids who seem to be on the brink of offending. And um, tomorrow, uh, President, well, on Wednesday, President Biden will be talking in Geneva to President Putin and reading the riot act about the fact that Russia gives um, sanctuary to cyber criminals who do ransomware. And if this leads to a treaty which enables Russian cyber criminals to be extradited to America, then presumably that will have a good deterrent effect. So yeah, 
and that's one of the things that you can do. Um, the, the other things that you can do is uh, uh, include changing the um, technology frontier um, so that crimes become more difficult to do. And the reason that we've got so much ransomware at the moment is quite frankly that we've now got uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which make it feasible to collect a $5 million ransom for the first time. You know, it, 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 it was never um, easy to do extortion in the past, right? I mean, it was easy enough to kidnap the heiress or her dog. But when you then phoned up her father and said, leave a million dollars in a carpet bag under Waterloo Bridge, well, hey, that carpet bag was going to get followed. It would maybe have a radio transmitter in it and you'd get caught. Thanks, that's really interesting. Uh, I know the Colonial Pipeline um, resonates um, well quite recently and, and what um, the US government has done uh, in, in that. There's a, another question from Vincent Blake, a VP at Persons. He says, we, we do, um, majority of our encryption in terms of, uh, you know, strengths uh, of crypto analysis is the keys and the algorithm themselves. On one hand, you see quantum quantum computing coming on board. Um, mm -hmm. So the use of quantum computing resources in cyber defense and attack, what do you think? What's your thoughts? Well, um, an awful lot of money has been raised by people promising that they will do some kind of quantum cryptography. And we've known how to do that as a toy since 1988 or thereabouts. Um, but it doesn't actually do anything useful because if you're going to use quantum key distribution to set up a key between Alice and Bob, um, what you then use that for is to key a line in crypto that uses AES. Uh, but you don't need to rekey a line in crypto using AES, right? Because if you believe the algorithm is sound, you only need to rekey it about once every two to the power of 64 uh, blocks are sent. And line in cryptos don't live long enough to send two to the power of 64 blocks. So it's a waste of time. So, uh, and if you did have to rekey them, you know, we've got mathematically provably secure ways of doing that. And so if you're trying to sell a physics way of doing it, you have to deny the mathematics in order to create a job opportunity for the physicists. So this is all highly unsatisfactory. And I'm not even sure that I believe many of the security proofs based on entanglement that the crypto quantum uh, crypto people offer. Um, as for using quantum computing to uh, factor um, large numbers, well, the quantum computing people have been factoring 15 for many years now, and um, maybe one of these days they'll get on to factoring 35. Um, hey, um, from, from their point of view, this has become an absolute gold mine. Um, you know, they observed that Ron Rivest and um, Adi Shamir and Len Adelman um, enabled number theorists to get their shovels into the military budget. And um, so talking about quantum computing is the, uh, the, the quantum physicist way of doing the same. For they'll build anything that ever works, I don't know. Personally, I'm skeptical. But if we believe in the cryptanalysis as being how long the keys are, which is why even with AES, you say, okay, use the 256 instead of 224 or 128. Surely uh, with quantum where you're using uh, Quibics uh, instead of bits, and uh, with parallel computing and cloud computing, you have high processing and you can compute that in a shorter space of time. You could actually cryptanalyze that particular key that has been exchanged based on that power of processing and also the compute uh, utilization. Well, the claim from the quantum computing people is that using Grover's algorithm, you can halve the effective key length of a symmetric cipher. But that's not a big deal because you just use 256-bit AES and it gives you the same protection against a quantum computer that 128-bit AES would give you against a, a, a classical computer. Now, the real claim from the uh, quantum computing people is about Shor's algorithm, which says that if you have a, a big enough quantum computer, uh, then you should be able to factor large um, products of two primes. Uh, and that would make RSA um, vulnerable to cryptanalysis. However, as I said, the practical demonstrations don't go past toy examples. And there are lots of good reasons of physics for this. 
Uh, playing around with qubits is really, really tricky because quantum states are very, very fragile. Um, they're destroyed as soon as they're observed. And um, you have to keep them at extraordinarily low temperatures and keep them uh, shielded from vibration and all the rest of it uh, in order to keep them in existence for more than a, a few nanoseconds. So it's very, very difficult to make this work as a practical thing. And also it would be very, very difficult to input data of any size to such a device. It would be rather likely uh, the first computers, computers like the Manchester Baby, where you basically have to set up your problem in um, switches on the front of the computer. No, I, I don't think there's any practical threat from uh, quantum computers. And if it does turn up, we can deal with it anyway, because uh, a great many of the systems on which we rely have got symmetric um, cryptography components as well as public key components. Um, the EMV system for uh, payment cards, for example, relies on a symmetric key that's shared between your payment card and the card issuing bank to generate message authentication codes on the transactions. So um, th there's not really a vulnerability there. Thanks for your perspective, um, Ross. Moving on, um, you've been a fan and a campaigner for um, computer security to be studied in the wider social context. And as this is a multidisciplinary conference, it's something that we wanted to know from you um, as a campaigner for that, as in what are the merits for this approach and what are the hurdles and barriers you face in campaigning for a wider contextual approach to cybersecurity or computer security, if I may? Well, the advantages of a multidisciplinary approach is that you get um, many more interesting results out because the interesting work is usually there to be done these days at the boundaries between disciplines rather than at their growing edges. And I think I've been very lucky in my career looking at um, security and economics, looking at security and psychology, looking at security and signal processing to give us three examples. Um, and now security and machine learning may um, give us a, a bit of fun for a few years as well. Um, the, the, the other thing that's been good to me in my career is looking at security of different applications, looking at security of payment networks, um, security of electricity transmission and distribution, um, security of, um, gosh, um, online medical records, just again, just to give three examples. Because it's once it's where the rubber hits the road and you start looking at real problems um, that you start doing good research. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here. Um, it says that we are, especially you are an academic, so there's been an uptake in online learning, remote learning, especially since the pandemic. And uh, education is now largely blended, hybrid, whether it is face-to-face -face in some part, people who can actually, if they're not on lockdown. So what, what are they, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges facing higher education in a post-pandemic world? So if we come out of pandemic, what, 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 would we go back to the old ways? What, what are the primary challenges you, in your opinion? Well, um, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I think um, we're learning that the provision of higher education perhaps doesn't um, particularly match market needs. Um, we produce large numbers of humanities graduates, um, particularly at the non-elite end of the sector, um, who often end up doing minimum wage jobs or nearly so. Um, you see in the traditional way of higher education, uh, the, the, the way it was organized, higher education would do two things. The first was human capital. You know, if you did a degree in computer science, you'd learn to program, and if you I did a degree in veterinary science, you'd learn to cut up cats and sew them back together again. Uh, and there's also an aspect of signaling in that people might do a degree in Latin and Greek in order to signal that they were clever and therefore suitable for employment in elite jobs, such as in the civil service or as prime minister. Uh, but if you have got a million people with degrees in classics, that doesn't serve any useful signaling function anymore. And this perhaps wasn't particularly well understood. At the same time, what, where Britain has gone wrong 
um, as the Augur report pointed out, is that we don't have anything like enough um, practical further education uh, to make people good at doing regular jobs. The number of people who get trained in apprenticeships um, is very much lower than it was when, when I was a youngster. Um, and that's something that we're going to have to fix if we're going to compete with places like Germany and the Netherlands and Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, as technology keeps on reinventing the world, there's going to be a call for more and more um, post-school further education. Um, I talked earlier about um, cyber security master's degrees or part-time executive education courses on security engineering. There will be more and more of that. Um, US universities like MIT, for example, um, are selling lots of one-off executive education courses to people who want to master a particular topic or learn a particular programming language or um, you know, get um, some basic competence with machine learning or whatever. There will be more of that. So um, I, I think you will see the higher education and further education sectors becoming more diverse. Now, the experience that we've got at delivering stuff um, online will help um, because we've learned that you don't have to sit kids down in a lecture theater to get the theory part of the course. They can get it from a video, they can get it from a book. But what um, you can't miss out is the interaction, the one-on-one -on -one interaction and small group interaction, which is the second part of the university teaching experience. Now, we have been learning that that can, to some extent, be delivered online too, although not perhaps as well. So in the future, you might see more and more executive education courses, which consist of um, a number of videos that you watch or books that you read, um, but followed up by regular interaction with tutors, either in person or online. And we're beginning to see this as a model already being fielded by the better US universities like MIT and Georgia Tech. So UK universities like Edinburgh and Cambridge will have to follow in due course. Thank you. Um, back in the days when I was doing mine, there was an element or an aspect of education that was a brand for that university. So you, you would go to a particular university because the brand would rub off you and part of it are the unspoken things. They are not the sort of things you would deliver over video because it's about the behavioral things that have been impacted from one academic to another. And the student then grew up with that brand, with that image, with that behavioral pattern. That, yep. seemed to be, that seemed to be lost or would be lost unless there's a way to put that into online and blended learning. What do you think? Are we going to lose the things that set us apart? Or are we just going to be cooker culture for every single person? from any university? <clears throat> well, of course, Cambridge had one of those brands and my other university, Edinburgh, has, has, has also got an elite brand. And the elite brands um, involve behavior that gets passed on within the student community, the student cohort. So the first year undergrads learn from the second year undergrads and so on. But that was already on, uh, in a state of decline even before the pandemic because more and more of the students going to universities in Britain are master's students rather than bachelor students, right? Because uh, we don't face the same cost controls on master's students and it's become a strong export sector. So many of the students at Cambridge simply turn up um, in October and leave again in June or July. And between successive cohorts of students, there isn't any student to student transmission. They may get something from the from the bachelor students to the doctoral students at the same um, college or the same department, but it's, it's, it's much attenuated. And when, when I think of the effect of the pandemic, um, our current second years who have just done their second year exams, who will be the third years next year, only ever had two terms being in Cambridge, you know, as fully immersed undergraduates. So the transmission of Cambridge traditions is going to be attenuated by the pandemic too. Um, is this a big deal? Well, hopefully it isn't a big deal. Um, there's also elite cohort aspects in that if you have a university in some country where the brightest people aspire to go, uh, then that becomes self-perpetuating. 
you know, regardless of whether the institution um, has got um, its own unique culture that it gives them, the fact that the bright people are there and they meet each other when they're and they assume that other people who've been there are bright people and therefore good for hiring um, creates its own dynamic. So there's a number of things here mix, all mixed together that uh, we may see being unpacked and reassembled somehow over the years to come. Thank you very much. There's uh, another question. Uh, it says, are you concerned about the extent of global aggregation of data storage and processing currently occurring in leading cloud security provider or services providers? Since security controls within the cloud security providers are not fully transparent or accountable, is there a need for a new global security governance regime? What are your thoughts? Well, this, this is indeed a very, very large issue. 10 years ago, we did a report for ENISA, the European Network and Information Security Agency, um, about systemic risks to the information society. And about the worst one that we had at the time back then was that a, an enemy could tear up the internet's um, routing fabric. Suppose, for example, China wanted to invade Taiwan and they have got lots of Huawei routers around the world, or they put malware in lots of Cisco routers. And um, at some predetermined time, um, these routers just start ad advertising lots of more specific routes. And as a result, the internet's routing tables fill up and the routers all thrash and nobody can connect to anybody else. Now, it might take three or four days to sort that mess out. And when it is sorted out, we wake up and we find that the People's Liberation Army is driving its tanks around Taipei. You know, that's the sort of thing that you worry about. Um, is there anything you can do to stop that? Um, well, there are things that people do, but they're probably not definitive. Now, 10 years further on, um, if China wanted to really trash the West, they would do something to pull down Amazon or Azure. Because a lot of companies depend entirely on Amazon. Uh, for their operations, and a lot of other companies depend entirely on Azure for their operations. So these have become critical infrastructure. And although some companies talk about having a multi-cloud strategy, I'd like to see that being um, tested in practice. Because both Azure and Amazon go out of their way to lock you in with funny customizations that make it difficult for you to run your stuff efficiently on them and also to run it efficiently on a competitor. And if you deliberately hold off from using that and deliberately drill so that your containers will run as, as, as well on anybody's platform, then you, you, you end up paying more money. So it's, it's difficult. It really is difficult. And what would, what would you mean by a, a global governance system that would fix that? I mean, uh, the, the, the big players are all U.S. companies, and yet the U.S. government is in absolute fear of them. And it's tiptoeing towards antitrust activity, but um, hey. There are a number of uh, moving calls to um, another area. Uh, there have been a couple of um, regulations that Europe have put forward. Um, recently, it's about their AI um, regulation, which is in draft now, and at the EU um, um, mem member discussion. And I don't think that the, um, and one of the things that they're saying within the AI regulation is about how we apply AI in areas or domains they deem as high risk. That isn't, there isn't any in the UK now. What, what's your opinion about um, regulation in general and has that helped? And do we, is that something that we, we, we need to embark upon in order to make the UK a, a better place to do um, uh, services and, and um, you know, in, enjoy the new ecosystem of, of interconnection and also a place that people can trust in doing business? Well, I think the UK gave up any pretense of being a global player with Brexit um, because the view in Silicon Valley is that privacy regulations are made in Brussels because Washington doesn't care and nowhere else is big enough to matter. Right. And when the UK Parliament tried to summon Suck to one of their hearings, he just ignored them. He went to Washington and he went to Brussels, but Britain doesn't matter. Right. I'm sorry, but that's that's the simple reality of it. 
So the, the best that Britain can hope um, is that we'll get decent uh, privacy standards and safety standards set uh, by the European Union and that we'll be able to uh, benefit from them you know, by sheltering under their lee. Uh, now, of course, there will be players who will go to the government and say, well, you did Brexit, you should abolish these stupid European regulations, Brussels red tape, the people voted to get rid of Brussels red tape. But you'll usually find that um, that um, results in people getting poorer service. Um, it, it'll uh, result in um, more dangerous you know, goods and products. Uh, it will result in uh, more privacy violations. Um, it will leave the UK um, as exposed and, and as inconsequential uh, as the typical less developed country. Thank you for that. We've got that five minutes to wrap up. But before we go, I, I have a question I, I, I am keen to ask is, for someone listening today who haven't made up their mind in what to study, and which area, because computer science, computer science is vast and computer security is becoming a mainstream discipline on its own right. And there are many facets in, in computer security. And you studied maths and natural sciences at Trinity College, Cambridge. And how has that helped you to, to become this person you are today and authority in many areas, if I may? Well, that's, at the root, it gave me the self-confidence that I could understand anything if I put my mind to it. That anybody who tried to bamboozle it with mathematics, I just ripped them to pieces. You know, I would I would go and understand the mathematics and, and come back quoting it and, and, and come back using it better than they did. So the the anti-bullshit factor um, and the confidence factor is really really powerful. And in the modern world, um, a real understanding of technology fulfills much of the same role. You see, when I was an undergrad in the mid 70s, you couldn't do an undergraduate computer science degree. It was basically a final year option or a graduate option. And now, of course, it's a subject in its own right. And, you know, not all of our graduates go on to become coding monkeys. About half do, but the other half go into consultancy or they um, use their computer science degree as a proof that they're smart to open the door into a career in banking or elsewhere just like their grandfathers would have used a degree in classics. So in terms of uh, now that it's become a major to study computer science, and if somebody wanted to do anything um, today, what would you, what would be your advice to someone, uh, you know, now, not, not several years ago, what would you, what would be your advice in terms of um, what they should to do in order to better their career or enhance their career? Well, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of things around um, career advice. Um, if you want to make money, you shouldn't um, aim at academia. Um, that's for sure. Um, you know, unless you go to America or Switzerland, for other people, <laughs> it's twice what we do. Um, but, um, you, you know, one of, the, one of the questions is, uh, are you a big company person or a little company person? Do you like the idea of being one programmer in a team of a thousand people at, at Google or at Barclays Bank or somewhere like that? Or do you rather prefer the idea of working in a startup where there's you know, two of you working on the Android app and two on the iPhone app and there's a couple on the server and then there's uh, four people you know, doing the sales thing, ringing up prospective customers and you've got the CEO ringing up the backers and asking for more money and you're all in one room together. You know, would you, would you rather like that kind of environment where you can see the whole business operating in front of you? Uh, or would you rather be a small cog in a big machine? Um, another thing to ask is whether your skills are primarily deep geek skills or primarily people skills. Uh, do, do, do you uh, like the idea of going out and selling um, or coordinating activity? Or do you think that you would be better off, um, you know, with your head down staring at a a small piece of a large infrastructure and trying to make it better. And these are down to people's uh, interests and aptitudes and personalities. We'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Ross. It's been fascinating and lots of insight. I, I've made a lot of notes myself and I've quite um, enjoyed your yeah, talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Speak soon. Cheers. Bye for now. Yeah.